guess I should officially start. I know some of you, but my name is Jeremy Zimmerman. I live right around the corner. Not a Berea native, but I practically feel like one. And my book is Make Mead Like a Viking. It is a how-to manual on making mead, but it's also about history and mythology of the Viking Age. I'm going to start with the introduction. Mead, Vikings. For many, it's impossible to think of one without the other. Go ahead, close your eyes. Clear your mind and try. As a matter of fact, before proceeding any further, put this book down, find a quiet spot, and take a moment to sit quietly with your eyes closed and forget everything you know. Forget what you've been told about brewing alcoholic beverages, that it requires all sorts of fancy equipment, and laboratory produced yeasts and chemicals, and that it's a complicated, time consuming process. Drop all your notions about the current state of food and drink production in a society that has become increasingly obsessed with uniformity and an overemphasis on sanitization. Take note, though, that I'm not talking about not being clean and producing your own food and drink. While the over sterilization prevalent in commercial production is ultimately necessary due to the strong potential for contamination, it also results in killing off all the good microbes that bring life to fermented food and drinks. As you're coming closer to a state of Viking Zen, allow your mind to detach itself from your body and travel back to an ancient world of fire and ice in which mythology, magic, and reality were so intertwined as to be one and the same. Now that you're settled comfortably in the land of the ancients, Raise your hand and point one finger skyward toward Asgard, the home of the Norse gods and fallen Vikings. Open one eye to emulate Odin, who drank from the well of Mimir to gain wisdom, leaving behind one of his eyes. You don't have to participate if you don't want. But stand up slowly and start spinning. Spin faster. Dance with wild abandon. Go berserk. Imagine yourself as a Viking decked out for battle, having just fortified yourself with a hearty meal of roast goat and mead. If you've already done so, even better. If not, perhaps this has helped you feel a bit intoxicated and free. Free to think, brew, and create, unfettered by the chains of a post-industrial, post-pasture world. With your low nail lighting a bit, Prepare an environment conducive to inviting in the busy man and brew pixies. Don't worry if you don't quite know what I'm talking about. All will make, be made clear in time. Even though you won't be brewing just yet, the goal here is to ensure that when you do begin, you've prepared the proper setting for brewing like a Viking. If you are into folk, medieval, or Viking-related music of any sort, put together a playlist of your favorites. If not, this is a good time to start. For the Norse and many other ancient cultures, music, dance, meditation, and community were all integral components of the brewing process. To them, this was magic. They didn't call upon the internet or head to the local brewing store to choose a yeast that had been prepared for them by men or women in white coats. They called upon the gods, quite literally as a matter of fact. Ancient mead-making traditions extend far beyond Nordic lands, Ethiopia, India, China, indigenous South American tribes. The list goes on. Nearly every culture has a deep connection with honey and the fermented beverages that can be made from it. In order to return to the simpler practices of our varied ancestral milieu, it is necessary that we unlearn complex and expensive modern methods of making honey-based ferments to create beverages that are truly magical and healthy. This is not a typical brewing manual, but you probably already guessed that from the title. Many of the techniques go against what you will read in modern brewing books that dwell heavily on tools, equipment, and ingredients that wouldn't have been available to ancestral cultures. The techniques I will outline have been tested thoroughly by myself and other DIY fermentation enthusiasts who have been gracious enough to share their processes with me. Not every brew you make will turn out perfect, but don't let that stop you. Don't feel that you need to go to a home brewing store or visit a home brewing website before you can get started in home brewing either. You can make excellent mead, beer, and wine using primarily what you find in your garden 
from local farms and beekeepers, and by extension farmers markets and co-ops, and in the wildness of nature. Nor is this a book that will consist primarily of straightforward brewing recipes, while I have interspersed recipes and outline techniques throughout the text. My goal is to weave a narrative on why you should brew and drink like the ancients. Research into ancient mindsets pertaining to the brewing of alcohol, storytelling and myth-making are the prevalent notions that fuel this book. Alcohol is looked at very differently in the distant and even recent past, and we will thus be transporting ourselves back in time so that we can approach brewing with a distinctively pre-modern mentality. In making wildcrafted brews, you will learn that it is more important to develop a rhythm than follow strict guidelines. Before you know it, you have shelves full of burbling airlocks and living ferments. Be warned, making your own ferments can become an addiction, not the negative kind with all the modern societal implications, but a healthy and livening, and we can only hope world-changing addiction. So how about it? Are you ready to head into the ancient magical past and learn to make meat like a Viking? And I'm going to skip forward just a little bit because as I mentioned in the introduction, I incorporate a lot of storytelling in history. So it's not just a manual about how to brew, but why to brew like the ancients. So um, starting on page nine, previous to that I talked a little bit about how the Norse, the Vikings believed the world was created. And as a quick summary of that, we're going to be talking about the Aesir, which was a branch of gods that were brash, reactionary, law-abiding, patriarchal gods and goddesses. And the Vanir, peace-loving, slow-moving, free-thinking, matriarchal, fertility-loving gods. I like to think of it as a battle between the hippies and the rednecks. And eventually I realized they had more in common than they thought. So, it starts how mead came to be. After a long war in which neither side gained any real traction, the two tribes of gods decided to reconcile. They chewed up some berries, spat into a cauldron. The communal mixing of saliva is an ancient reconciliation tradition. And let the berries ferment. But rather than the intended ferment of beverage, what rose from the cauldron was Gvasir, the wisest of all beings. It is unclear whether Gvasir was a man, a god, or another being altogether. But the poems he spoke and the stories he told made even the hardest hearted of gods and men weep. His words were like pure gold and caused his listeners to transcend into previously unknown realms of the mind. He could wisely answer any question put to him. The dwarfs, being dwarfs, saw Kvasir as a great treasure and coveted him for themselves. Two particularly malicious dwarfs, Galar and Fjallar, kidnapped Kvasir. Once they had him in their deep caverns, they murdered him and drained his blood into three cauldrons, later telling the gods that Kvasir had suffocated from an excess of wisdom. Now that the dwarfs possessed the great wisdom of Kvasir, they sought to preserve it, not because they wanted to gain and share wisdom, but because they wanted to hoard it for themselves. Knowing that when mixed with the proper amount of liquid, honey would transform that liquid into a magical ecstasy-inducing substance. The dwarfs added honey to the cauldrons containing Kvasir's blood. Thus was born ancient mystical mead, which could turn anyone who drank it into a poet, full of charm and with a magnificent singing voice. You know, kind of how you think of yourself when you sing karaoke after a few too many drinks. <laughs> of course, the dwarfs had no intention of sharing it, nor did they taste it. The three vessels were named Otharir, Inspiration, Son, Reparation, and Bodin, Offering. Otharir, or Mead of Poetry, was what mead came to be called over time. It can also refer to the vessel in which mead is held as it inspired wise words through poetry and song by scouts skilled enough to know how to pass along the wisdom gained from drinking it. These dwarfs, though, were no scouts. Emboldened by their success, several of the dwarfs traveled throughout Midgard, pestering any humans they met along the way, and then sought to enter Jotunheim to pick on the giants. The first victim was Gilling, a simple-minded giant whom the dwarfs came across sleeping on a steep bank and rolled into the water to drown. Not content with the level of wickedness to which they had already stooped, they gleefully went back to Gilling's house, screamed that he was dead, and dropped a millstone onto the head of his distraught wife, 
you know, she came running out leaping for her husband's death. The nasty little buggers were on a roll and continued to wreak havoc throughout the old time, raucously singing songs about their great cunning and the stupidity of the giants. Maybe they took a sip of the magic meat after all. Not all the giants were stu as stupid as the dwarfs assumed in their arrogance, though. One particularly pissed off and crafty giant, Suto, Jolene's brother, finally had enough. While the dwarfs were engaged in one of their drunken songs, Sutung snuck up and captured them. He then took them out to a rock in the sea during low tide and set them on it. As the waves began to rise to the terrified dwarfs' necks, they tried anything they could to save their hides. They offered gold, jewels, and other items of food. But giants have no interest in flashy bling. As the water continued to rise, the desperate dwarfs offered the magic meat. Realizing this was a coveted item the giants could use as collateral in their war against the gods, Sutung agreed to take the meat, tossed the dwarfs in the boat, and rowed back to land. He then brought them back to Svartalfheim, the home of the dwarfs, and bellowed into the caverns his intent to squash the heads of his hostages between his fingertips if the cauldrons of magic meat weren't brought to him immediately. He then plopped down to wait, tormenting the dwarfs under their screams. So their screams would make it clear he was serious. Realizing that not submitting to Sutton's request would pit them as adversaries of both the giants and the gods, the dwarfs decided they were finished with this game and brought the jars of magic mead to the surface. Upon bringing this mead, the mead to his great hall, deep within the caverns of a mountain, Sutton placed a spell on his daughter, the beautiful giant maiden Gunwood, causing her to appear as a hideous witch with long teeth and sharp nails, and locked her in a small cavern with the magic mead, with a directive to guard it night and day, and allow neither gods nor mortals to have so much as a taste. Finish the story, I think it takes about five minutes, I'm pretty sure I've still got a little bit of time, so if they cut me off, then... Well, you're, we go down lunch after, after you, so you can speak because we have an audience. <laughs> okay. it, it, usually, this part is about 15 minutes, but I mean, overall. So I will continue. How Odin stole the magic me. Odin, a complex god and the eldest and wisest of the Aesir, was part trickster, part shaman, part warrior, and part poet. Due to his skills and animism, he could take many forms. At times, he would travel midnight disguised as a victim to wanderer. A direct influence for Tolkien and Gandalf, an old man with a dark blue cloak, a long white beard, a staff, and a wide-brimmed hat. Part of the rim was kept turned down to hide the socket of the eye he sacrificed at the well of Mimir to gain great wisdom. Vecton was often accompanied by two ravens, Hugin and Munin, from the Old Norse, Hugin for thought, and Munin for desire, who traveled between Midgard and Asgard as his messengers and spies. While his, when his ravens brought to him word of the misdeeds of the dwarfs and how Sutung had thwarted them, Odin immediately began plotting with the other Azir to acquire the magic mead and bring it back to Asgard. As the other gods prepared vessels to hold the mead, Odin closed up the caverns of the dwarfs so that they would never again be able to enter the world of men and went forth disguised as Vegtum the Wanderer to infiltrate the hall of Sutung, now known as the Mead Wolf. This was no simple task, as Sutung, son of the fire giant Surtur, who in time will battle with the gods of Ragnarok and bring about the end of this world so that a new one may arise, resided deep in a mountain cavern that was closed off to the outside world save for one entrance, which was guarded by a formidable dwarf sentinel. As the first step in his carefully crafted plan, Odin approached nine thralls, literally an unfree servant, belonging to Baugi. Sutung's brother, who were swinging their scythes in a field to little avail. Upon seeing Odin's victim, the thralls asked him if he would go tell Bogi that their scythes were dull and that they would stop mowing until they were provided with a whetstone. Conveniently, the mysterious wandering old man had a whetstone on him. Upon wetting their scythes, the grass practically fell down on its own with barely a swing. The thralls then begged Odin to give them the whetstone, which he did by tossing it over a wall. The thralls all jumped over the wall in pursuit of the whetstone, several of them wounding one another with their sharpened scythes. Names were called, blame was passed, and they fought among themselves, all dead or mortally wounded in the end. Odin, who appeared as a giant to giants and a man to men, then recovered his whetstone and paid a visit to Baugi to ask for supper and lodging. 
a giant who followed the Norse tradition of providing hospitality to strangers, acquiesced, offered Odin a place to rest, and brought him some food. During supper, a messenger arrived who reported that Valgi's thralls had been found dead. Frantic about the potential loss of hay for the winter, the giant panicked, but since this was all part of the Azir's plan, Odin offered to work for him. Valgi was initially reluctant to hire a single person to mow all his winter hay, but the stranger offered to do the work of nine men in a day to prove himself, so he accepted. When Odin proved he could live up to his end of the deal, Valgi implored that he stay for a payment of Odin's choice at the end of the season. Odin returned his winter set in, having harvested all the wheat, and demanded his reward, a draft of a magic mead. Distraught, Valgi first claimed that he didn't know where it was, but when Odin reminded him that Sutung possessed it, he begged Odin to ask for another reward, as he feared Sutung greatly. Odin was insistent, so Baugi went to his brother, saying that he was in a bind and needed just a draft of the magic mead. Exploding in rage, Sutung called his brother an oaf and a fool and other terrible names, and told him he would give him none of the magic he would give none of the magic mead to one of the Asir, as he had quickly deduced that only one of their sworn enemies would have asked for this reward. Returning to his home, Baugi implored Odin to ask for another reward, as he knew of no way into the mountain that didn't involve battling hordes of angry giants. Odin, however, was already one step ahead. From his cloak, he pulled out an auger and demanded that Baugi, Baugi use all his strength to bore a hole into the mountain. Baugi took the auger and started boring, then quickly pulled it out, claiming he had completed his part of the bargain and prepared to leave. Odin, not easily fooled, flew into the hole, causing bits of dust and rock to fly into his face. He handed the auger back to Balgi, telling him to finish the job and knock off his poor attempts at trickery. Grumbling, Balgi took the auger, bored some more, and handed it back. Trusting he had done the job this time, Odin changed into a snake and wriggled through the hole, narrowly outracing the auger that Balgi thrust in after him in an attempt to avenge his damaged pride. Once he arrived in Gunlad's cave, Odin changed back into his full godly form in an attempt to woo Gunlad so she would take his hand in marriage. He succeeded, and she lay with him and pleasured him on her couch for three full days. So entranced was she with Odin and his godly powers in the sack that she allowed him to drink his fill of the magic meat. He did, finishing off all, all three vessels. His job complete, he bade, bade Gunlad farewell, changed into an eagle, and flew back out of the, the hole. Halfway to Asgard, Odin realized that he was being pursued by Suttung, who had also transformed into an eagle. But fortunately for Odin, the other gods had been planning for his return. When they saw Suttung closing in, they prepared a massive pile of combustible materials just within the walls of Asgard. They set fire to the materials as Suttung flew over, singeing his wings and causing him to fall into the fire and perish. They had also set out three vessels into which Odin regurgitated the meat. In his rush to spit it all out, he let three drops fall to Mid Midgard, which were subsequently discovered by humans. This excess mead was known as the Rhymster's Share, and the recipients were poet tasters. In addition, at times, Odin intentionally gifted mankind with a portion of the mead that had been reserved for the gods. These people went on to become renowned scholars. In gratitude, they worshipped Odin as the god of poetry, song, and elegance. In some variations of the story, Odin did swallow the mead, while in others, he swallowed it and regurgitated it. I prefer the latter, as it emulates what bees do, regurgitating nectar to turn it into honey. And I think I'll go ahead and stop with that.